We all know that loss of control in flight or lock eye is one of the leading categories of causes of accidents. But we always think lock eye is continuing VFR into IMC conditions where the pilot loses visual references or flying in the vicinity of a thunderstorm. But overloading an aircraft or loading it in such a way that the center of gravity is out of limits can also lead to a loss of control. As long as you can close the door, the air will fly. Yeah, okay, not always true. But you have to ask yourself the question, why do some pilots overload an aircraft or load an aircraft in such a way that the center of gravity is out of limits, knowing that it could kill them or their passengers? Are they ignorant? Or have they forgotten what they were taught? Or have been doing it so long that they become blasé? It won't happen to me. It's a bad attitude of Ill, Ill, invulnerability. In October 2008, the pilot of this Piper Lance took off from runway 35 at Rand Airport. There were six people on board. The, uh, they got airborne at about just after 8 in the morning. Temperature was only 18 degrees Celsius. Q nature 1023, which gave a pressure altitude of 5,180 feet. Now, with the outside temperature of 18 degrees, the ISA deviation was 13 degrees, giving a density altitude of 6,740 feet, effectively making the aircraft overweight by 260 pounds. As I said, they eventually got airborne. The climb out was not really as the pilot had expected it to be, and he soon realized something was, was not good here. So he opted to aim for a field. He lowered the gear, informed air traffic control that he was going to carry out a forced landing. On landing, the aircraft hit a pile of rubble, flipped over, and burst into flames. When emergency services arrived on the scene, all they found was the burnt out wreck and the charred remains of the occupants. A preventable accident with a sad loss of life. The aim of my presentation is for you to achieve a better understanding of the effects of high density altitude and the dangers of overloading. I'll be looking at the following. The duties of the pilot in command. Now, if you look at the Civil Aviation Regulations Part 9102.7, it names 21 duties of the pilot in command. I will only be concentrating on two. What is density altitude? Effectively, it is the pressure altitude corrected for the ISA temperature deviation. The effects of density altitude well, the higher the density altitude, the poorer the performance of the aircraft. Simple as that. We'll look at a couple of calculations, nothing higher grade, and we'll also look at a, at a graph or a table from a Cessna 210 manual. Then I also want to look at weight and balance. Overloading an aircraft comes with a variety of problems. We'll quickly highlight that. But it's not just about how you load the aircraft, it is also how you distribute the weight. And that, I will qu quickly discuss the effects of it. Too far aft. Let's have a look at the duties of the pilot in command. You can read these for yourselves. Now, I'm not here to throw the book at you. It's not my style. But you have to ask yourself the question, what was that pilot thinking when he chose to ignore the regulations? After all, the regulations are written in the blood of those who got it wrong. I love aviation, and I'm sure you all do. And I see no reason for someone who is passionate about aviation to be threatened by regulations. You should be motivated and proud enough to say, look here, I've done all the work that what it takes to ensure that this flight is going to be safe. I've made safety my highest priority and we are good to go. So 
Let's have a look at the effect of density altitude. If you look at the diagram on the left hand side, now remember here, this is for a constant volume or a given volume. So the picture on the left hand side is where the atmospheric pressure is a bit lower and therefore the distance between the particles are further apart, hence lower density. Compared to the one on the right hand side where the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is higher, you can fit more particles into this given volume, they're closer to one another and the air will be more dense. Now if you look at the picture on the right hand side, once again same volume, but if one where the temperature is higher, the particles have more energy, they're bouncing against one another and they are further apart, hence lower density. But how does this affect the flight? With, the, with more dense air, as you can see the particles are closer, you can fit more air into the, into the engine. You can fit more air, for, there's more airflow around the propeller. The propeller biters more. There's more airflow over the wing. So the engine produces more power. The propeller produces more thrust and the wing generates more lift. Remember we said that density altitude is the altitude, performance-wise, where the aircraft thinks it is. Now let's, that put, let's put that in numbers. For a decrease in pressure by one hectopascal, that equates to 30 foot, on average, up to 5,000 feet. And for, a, for each degree Celsius increase in temperature, the density, uh, the density altitude increases by 120 foot. Now let's see for serious. Now this picture should be nothing new to you. Here we have an aircraft getting airborne at sea level using a, just over 700, 700 foot takeoff run compared to an aircraft at a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet where the takeoff run is slightly more than double. But what you should remember here, this is only the effect of pressure altitude, not density altitude. So for a, for a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, you could say for each thousand foot of increase in density altitude, the takeoff run increases by 10%. And for each one degree Celsius above standard, the takeoff run increases by about 12%. So remember, the higher the density altitude, it's going to affect the engine, the propeller, and the wing. So let's have a look at a density altitude calculation. Nothing higher grade here. So the example is we have a QNH of 1023, elevation of 5,500 feet, outside air temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. What is the density altitude? So step number one, is determine the pressure altitude. Step number two is correct for the temperature deviation. So determine the pressure altitude. So we take the difference between the QNH, which was 1023, and the QNE, 1013, that's 10 hectopascal. Remember we said earlier on for one hectopascal equals an average 30 foot. So 10 hectopascal, 300 foot. So, what is the pressure altitude? We said that the elevation is 5,500 feet, and that's at a QNH of 1023. So, where would 1013 fit in? Obviously, it's a lower pressure, so it'll be higher. So, this difference is 300 foot. So, elevation, 55, 300 foot difference. So, you're looking at a pressure altitude of 5,200 foot. Okay, remember that. So now, now we must look at what is the ISA temperature at a pressure altitude of 5,200 foot. So, ISA lapse rate is minus 2 degrees per 1,000 foot. So, for 5,000 foot, lapse rate will be minus 10 degrees. ISA temperature, sea level, 15 degrees Celsius, a lapse rate of minus 10. That will give you a ISA temperature at 5,000 foot pressure altitude of 5 degrees. But we said in our example that the outside air temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Therefore we're looking at an ISA deviation of 20 degrees. 
Remember we said 1 degree is 120 foot. So therefore 20 degrees, 2,400 foot. So there we go. We're looking at a pressure altitude of 5,200 foot plus the difference there in temperature of 2,400 foot will give us a, a density altitude of 6,800 foot. Here we've got a, a table from a from manual or from a Cessna 210 manual. All these manuals, whether it's a Cessna or a Boeing or an Airbus, they are all based on pressure altitude. So all you really have to do is to find out what the pressure altitude. But if you forget what the sum is, all you can do is you go to the subscale of the altimeter, dial in 1013, and the little hand and the big hand will show you pressure altitude. So just as an example here, we've got a pressure altitude of 5,000 foot. If you come across here for 20 degrees, and you look at now at 30 degrees, on average there for 10 degrees, you're looking at 200 odd foot, 60 meters. 60 meters, well, that's three quarters of a football field. See where it becomes really important. But now, I have a question for you. You've looked up this figure. Is that your final answer? I have a question for you. How proficient are you? How current are you? Can you guarantee that you can handle this flight? Are you proficient enough to handle all the challenges of this given flight? I'm sure you're familiar with this I'm safe table or the I'm safe rule. I just want to highlight three of them. Stress. We all know that if we're under stress, our memories are affected and our, de our decision-making capabilities are affected. Fatigue. How good or how bad was your last sleep opportunity? If you are fatigued, your cognitive skills are affected and your decision-making abilities are worse. Emotions. We all know if you're not in a good space, things easily go pear-shaped. So, would, would it not be prudent to have a slightly increase our personal limits? Just to be ready for that curveball, just to buy some extra time for that startle factor. I would say at least 10%. This slide here looks at the effects of temperature on indicated airspeed and true airspeed. Now, as you know, indis indicated airspeed is a measure is measured by the Peter tube and the static tube, whereas true airspeed is the actual speed of the aircraft through the air. Now, for ISA conditions or under ISA conditions, indicated airspeed will be exactly the same as true airspeed. But as the altitude increases, the density of the air decreases, therefore indicated airspeed decreases. Now, in order to fly the same indicated airspeed, the true airspeed has to increase. Now, we did mention that the true airspeed is effectively is the speed of the aeroplane through the air. Because it's higher, the aircraft has more energy, kinetic energy. It will have more momentum. And this will come to effect when it comes to stopping distance after landing. So take for example, a pilot is accustomed to fly into a lodge early morning. Now there was a delay for whatever reason. Now he's flying into the same airfield, but in the afternoon, at the hottest part of the day. And he's going to be in, a, in for a surprise because the aircraft will have more momentum, and uh, if he's not ready for it, there could be a possibility of a runway excursion or a runway overrun. Now, it's not just the weight or the load of the weight, but it is also how the load is distributed. So let's look at, first of all, an aft center of gravity and then a forward center of gravity. So if the center of gravity is too far aft, the moment arm or the distance between the center of gravity and the control surfaces I, in this case the elevator and the rudder, is less. Therefore, the control effectiveness will be less. And this could have an effect on the stall recovery. It could even make a spin recovery impossible. What happens if the center of gravity is too far forward? Now, with a forward center of gravity, to balance the downward force of the 
tail, that effectively increases the weight of the aircraft. Once again, making it heavier, heavier affecting the performance. Let's have a look on the takeoff run. With a forward center of gravity, because of the weight, the elevator may not be effective enough to rotate the aircraft off the ground. Same as for the landing, it might not have enough elevator force to get the aircraft into a flare. Be it as it may, for a forward center of gravity, the takeoff distance and the landing distance will both be increased. What about single engine operations on a twin engine, twin engine aircraft? With the center of gravity is aft, as I mentioned, the moment arm will be shorter. The rudder will not be that effective, which once again could affect, or not, the rudder may not be effective enough to control the yaw of that uh, inoperative engine. You may have heard people say to you, be safe out there. Make safe to your highest priority. Be alert. Your country needs alerts. But those words mean diddly squat if you don't have any tools. So I hope that during this presentation that at least you got some tools to go out there and make better decisions, make, make better pre-flight planning, and then you can fly safer. So your take home here, low pressure plus high temperature, i.e. hot and high, equals high density altitude. High density altitude lower or poor performance. The engine won't, be, won't produce that much power. The propeller won't produce that much thrust. The wings will generate less lift. Overloading, remember when you overload an aircraft, you exceed the structural limits of the aeroplane. Incorrect loading, it will affect the controllability. And you might not be able to get out of those difficult situations. So, now you've got the tools. Now you can go out there. When someone says, be safe, make safety the highest priority, now you will be able to do that. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you for your attention.